I think we're going to get started for real this time. Uh, this gentleman, John Rusk, I uh, had a nice dinner with him last night. He came all the way from New Zealand to share with us better agile through stealing. So let's uh, hear from John. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, am I coming through all right? Yes. Yep, good. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, as the big picture says, I flew a long way today to be here, and it's really great to actually be in a, in a group of Agile people here in the States. I've been wanting to come over and come to one of these conferences for a long time. When I saw this one, I thought, yeah, that's the one I want to go to, uh, because I think the kind of themes of it, the, the, the roots and shoots thing, is, is really important. So how I want to hopefully contribute to this Roots and Shoots thing today is to talk about ideas that we can steal from various other fields, from business, psychology, economics, those sort of things, to help us both with the, the roots, the foundations of Agile, and also perhaps with some of the shoots, some of the, the new things that we can build on. And I'm going to structure the talk today around the four points from the Agile Manifesto, which Alistair took us through earlier except I'm not going to talk about one of them, the working software one. Oops, that was meant to cross out. Let's try that again. Working software one, I'm not going to be talking about that one today just because I haven't got anything to say and I haven't got enough time to say it, even if I had something. So we're going to rip into the other ones and we're going to try and tie it back a little bit to uh, what we were talking about this morning. As I was sitting there, especially in the panel discussion, I was thinking, hey, you know, that relates a little bit to this thing and that thing and the other thing. So without further ado, let's have a look at how at one of the areas that I've discovered that I think really helps us with responding to change over following a plan or as, what was your term for it, Alistair? Attend to current reality. Attend to current reality, which is a great term, but I never got around to quickly putting it on my slide. So, one of the things that I've, I've stumbled across, and this presentation is essentially a bunch of things I've stumbled across over the past four or five years when I go, man, that's relevant to Agile, that, that could be helpful. And one of the things that really helps here is this thing called evidence-based management. Now, evidence-based management, it's, the name of it is inspired by a thing called evidence-based medicine. Uh, if your doctor is as talkative as mine, he might have mentioned it to you. And the evidence-based medicine one basically starts off like this. We're not going to treat this particular illness the same way it's been treated for the past 50 years just because that's the way it's always been done. Instead, we're going to say, is the traditional treatment actually better than doing nothing? Is the traditional treatment better than new treatments? And so evidence-based management comes and applies some of that to business management. And it also takes it much further. We're only going to be able to scratch the surface of it today. We're going to talk about how it's relevant to uh, responding to change over following a plan. So they, in the evidence-based management community, they have a manifesto that is a, is a little bit like ours, but it's a bit more wordy. This is copy and pasted right off their website, and we're not going to talk about all of it today. I, just, I guess I wanted to put it up there in part to draw the parallel with our own manifesto, and in part to illustrate that I'm only going to really talk up today about these two here in the middle. And I would have liked to have talked about some of the others because there's, there's lots of relevance in lots of different parts of it. The first one there, number two that I'd like to talk about, is getting the best evidence and using it to guide actions. And we can see that on two levels in Agile. We see it within a project, which we'll talk about some more in a minute. But we also see it in the sense that Alistair was talking about this morning, when he went round when he was working for IBM and looked at all those different project teams and said, what is and isn't working here? And that's one of the really appealing things about Agile, is to know that we've got this evidence, we've got that research behind it. And what the evidence-based management people are saying is that too much of what goes on in the business community doesn't have that behind it. It's fads, it's doing things because it's trendy. And you know, there's a lesson in there for the business community and there's a lesson in there for us. And the good news is that we really do have the solid stuff behind what we're doing in Agile, particularly if we look in the right places and we, we remind ourselves of what this conference is about, which is indeed to go and to drill back behind the superficial things of, oh, you sit in pairs and you don't write any documents, and actually get back to some of the heart of what the roots of Agile is about. I should mention that this evidence-based management stuff that comes out of uh, primarily a couple of guys who are at Stanford University, very high-flying academics who also spend a lot of time in the real world, which probably explains why the quality of their, their stuff is so high. And the other reason that this interests me, that I should mention, is because I think it gives us a way to sell what we are doing to business people. Uh, we had some questions earlier on on, you know, how do you, how do you get businesses to buy into this kind of thing? And here is something that comes out of the business community. Here is a bunch of business people who 
being evidence-based actually can prove that these things, these five things on the slide, really, really matter. The first one is basically our trust, or our personal safety, should I say, as per Crystal. And so there's all these things that are relevant to us that these people are already pitching to the business community and it's already gaining momentum and traction in there. And we've got to be able to use that and leverage that when we're selling essentially the same idea with different words into the business community. So I think this is a real help. Um, someone mentioned the phrase earlier, tilting at windmills. You know, if you're trying to sell Agile, how much influence can you really do? And here is this whole field of study and research and writing and practical experience that is already selling this to business people. So let's tap into that and use that as we sell the same ideas. The other one I wanted to talk about, the second one here, uh, sorry, third one, is treat your organization as an unfinished prototype. Learn by doing. And again, there's this complete independent discovery of our notion of feedback, our notion of learning as we go. And in fact, I really like the way they phrase it. They phrase it with this bit in the middle here which I really, really like, that says best organizations have the courage to act on what they know right now and the humility to change course when they find better evidence. And that really connected with me. When I read that, I thought, hey, that's responding to change over following a plan in really, really eloquent language. Uh, and so to me, that's a really, uh, really important thing. I've also seen it phrased as act on your knowledge while doubting what you know. And it captures, in a way, the real tension that we have when we try and pitch Agile to business people because we're effectively asking them to do this. We're asking them to get started on a project when they do not have a 3,000 page spec, when we're telling them that we're going to change our minds later. And effectively what this is saying is this is what those very same businesses should be doing, not just in software, but in everything they do. So certainly really encourage us to tap into that, both in terms of informing our own understanding of this and in terms of selling what we're doing in Agile. The other main point, this is one that I think connected a lot with some of what we were talking about earlier, was individuals and their interactions and some of the stuff that feeds into this from all sorts of other fields. Now, my own journey on this has been an interesting one. Um, I started off as the sort of stereotypical kind of shy nerd when I entered the industry about 13 odd years ago. And I had this realization that if I carried on like that, it wasn't going to be very good for my career. And so I said to myself, look, you've got, to, you've got to do something about this. And the starting point, to give you an idea of, of what a, a low level I was starting from, one of the things I remember doing is forcing myself every morning to say hello to the receptionist. And that, was, that felt like a, a, a challenge for me. So I hope that most people in the room are starting from a somewhat less challenged starting point. But the, the big thing that I've learned from my personal journey, and that now as I've started looking into some of these fields we're going to talk about today, is the level of change that you can undergo personally in your skills and your enjoyment of this side of work. There's a, a very similar story to, to mine of a, a university uh, professor who had the same realization that I did of, this is gonna hold back my career. And he said, because basically he was essentially a, a real introvert. He said, this is gonna get in my way. And so he basically got into the habit of acting in an extroverted way. And I don't mean <laughs> telling jokes and all, but I mean you know, engaging with people. We were talking about engagement before. And, and it can seem like an effort, certainly that's my experience, it can seem like an effort to engage. But in my experience, you get used to it and you actually realize to your surprise that you kind of like it. Uh, and this, this story of this guy, you know, he went on to become indistinguishable from an extrovert. Now on, on the inside, maybe he, he still felt like, in fact, he did still feel like he hadn't completely changed. But for all practical purposes, he had. And we have this notion in terms of individuals and interactions that so much of what happens in this area is simply ingrained in people that either you have soft skills or you don't, you have people skills or you don't. We have so much talking like this. We have personality profiling, which kind of, again, encourages this thought that either you have these skills or you don't. And my experience and my, is that you can change this stuff so much through practice. Now, it's not gonna happen overnight. We're gonna get to that in a minute. And so what I wanted to discover as I started to move into some of these fields, and Alice mentioned earlier, we should be studying psychology. And as best I can, as someone with a full-time job as a, as a nerd, I have tried to study some of these things in, in my spare time. And I've been really encouraged to find that this notion of uh, these key skills and aspects of our personality, I've been very pleased to discover that they are far more changeable than I had ever thought they were, and probably the most, you know, most people in the IT probably don't realize how changeable these things are. 
there's a, one of the fields that um, touches on this is this thing called positive psychology, which is this really seriously cool thing, uh, which I don't have a lot of time to talk about today. But one of the, the foundation books in that is a thing called Learned Optimism, how you can permanently change your level of optimism. Uh, and, and you're like, wow, you know, who thought you could do that? You know, before that book was written, who thought that that was a, a, a valid and a useful thing for a person to do? And so the level of change in this is potentially very large. Now, you can't change everything. The, the corresponding thing on happiness out of positive psychology is you can change about 40% of the happiness that you have in life. The other 60% you probably can't do anything about it. So the other analogy I've heard on this is that it's a bit like dieting. If you are naturally skinny, as I am, you know, you can be skinny without a lot of effort. If you are naturally, you know, a larger person, it takes more effort than you can achieve it. And I think that's what it's like with some of these interpersonal skills that maybe don't come naturally to those of us who are geeks. We may require more effort than, you know, our buddy who's, you know, uh, I don't know, an accountant, that's the bad example, uh, um, you know, a, a, in sales. Um, you know, we may require more effort to uh, become good and become comfortable in these things. So it's just like someone who maybe requires a bit more effort in, in dieting, they can still achieve the result. So that's essentially the, the central theme of what I've got here. Central theme number one is the level of change and learning that we can undergo as individuals. And we'll come back to some of the other key themes shortly. I just wanted on this slide just to take you through some of the, the areas that I've found that relate to this. When I first started looking into this, I, I, again, another part of my personal journey is that not only have I had to learn the stuff I've just been talking about, but I've had some real ups and downs in terms of the successes of my interactions with, with people at work. Some have been very successful and some have been just complete train wrecks. And I thought, okay, Agile says it's about individuals and their interactions. Surely this Agile movement can tell me how to do this stuff. So I jumped on Google and I found out this wonderful uh, collaboration page and nothing else. You know, there are thousands of things on tools and processes, you know, thousands of things that tell me how to do TDD, various factions of TDD, the mockists versus the classicists and the, the factions of the mockists. And, but when the manifesto was put together on the hills up there, you know, eight years ago, it was saying that this stuff here, this, this stuff right here is more important than processes and tools. And I definitely agree with the person who said earlier in the panel, Mike, that is Agile broken? And in this sense, I think it is broken. We're not putting emphasis in the right place here. We're talking and talking and talking about processes and tools when this is the thing that makes the difference. And we've always said it was the thing that made the difference. So I started to look elsewhere, and I discovered this thing called organizational behavior, which defines itself like this. And I read that definition, and I thought, man, this thing is people and their interactions at work. That's the thing. That's the thing I'm looking for. That's the thing that Agile's not telling me about. And this is this whole area, area of study with you know, academic stuff and practical stuff, again, that same academic practical mix that I, I mentioned earlier, which is so successful. And I was like, man, this is the thing I've been looking for. And so I looked around a bit more and I discovered organizational psychology, and the difference between the two is basically that one is taught in business schools and one is taught in psychology departments. Um, and so I, and there's positive psychology, and there's this very new thing where the two meet, two come together in this thing called positive organizational psychology. And there's not a lot of stuff out there, but it's touching on some of what I've talked about today. These notions that you can learn all sorts of stuff that is relevant to your ability to have a successful interpersonal relationship at work. And we were talking earlier about trust. And is trust the right word for this thing that we're trying to do? And to me, I was sitting here thinking, whatever it is, it's this thing that, that particularly this bit is about, and some of these other things here, political skill, it's about interacting successfully with people around us. So sometimes it is building trust, sometimes it's influencing them before we've had a chance to build trust. And it's all these combinations of things. And so this political skill at work is a, is a fascinating thing. Now normally political has some kind of negative connotation to it. But basically what these guys are talking about is kind of the, the good side of the force, so to speak. And the idea that you can learn how to influence people you know, for good at work and the interesting thing that they teach, and I was relieved to find it because I want to tell you guys this is true, and um, so I had to find out whether it was, is that you can learn this stuff, this business of being able to influence colleagues or managers more successfully than you do now, to sell an idea or to interact, is by and large a learnable skill. And yet, so much of the industry, including the part of the industry that we're in, 
is not necessarily investing enough effort in this. You know, it's perfectly normal for geeks to talk about doing their Microsoft certifications or their Java certifications, but who ever talks about learning this stuff? Who even knows that you can learn this stuff? Um, uh, you know, if you don't think you can learn it, of course you're not going to talk about it, of course you're not going to try. And so one of the things that I hope comes out of, of this talk here today is that when we go back to our, our various places of work, you know, there'll be people sitting on adjacent desks to you who are like I was 10 or 15 years ago. Geeks who think they can't do this and who don't know it's learnable. And if we can take some of this message back to them, I think that could be a really, really powerful thing. Now don't go up to someone and say, hey, this guy talked about individuals and, and their interactions, you should learn that. Um, you know, I have got far enough to learn that the, the full frontal assault of persuasion is seldom successful. But you know, what does work is gentle nudges over a long period of time. And I think we, as a group, I'd love to see us giving some of those nudges uh, to try and introduce this idea that this stuff is learnable and try as a group to understand some of the ways that it can be learnt. This was my sort of summary slide for this area, and I've talked about it being important. I think in a way that's obvious. Certainly there is a lot of research from outside our field that again backs up how important this is. There's a, uh, there's a case study done in a pharmaceutical company of um, which teams were the most successful ones. And the one that stood out, they said, well, what's the difference about this team? And it was the richness of their connections, both to each other and to people outside their team and outside their organization. So this stuff has a, a provable effect on, on you know, outcomes. It's learnable, as we said. And so I want to talk briefly about the ways of learning it. So I'm just going to figure out when I'm supposed to be stopping talking here, because I've lost track of it. Cool. Um, there's this guy who's done a lot of research on expertise. What does it become? What does it take to become an expert in tennis, in some other sport, in uh, you know uh, computer programming, or in interpersonal interaction? And what he's found is this uh, several key notions. The one I'm going to single out today is a thing called deliberate practice. And basically, that means not just accumulating a lot of years of experience under your belt, but learning. So if I go down to the tennis court and I do the same bad serve 20 times in a row, I haven't learned. If I do my bad serve the first time and I reflect on how I could do it better and I do it slightly better and I keep doing that cycle, that's deliberate practice, or at least in my naive understanding of it, that's deliberate practice. And the thing he finds with this is that it does take time. The same research says it takes 10 years to become an expert. And you know, I've talked a bit about my journey with this and I'm not an expert on this yet, but certainly it's taken me a number of years. So none of this, this is not a thing you take away and shabang, it's wonderful. This is a process you take away, you can start to put into place, and it will bear fruit over the course of months and years. Um, so I want to say about deliberate practice, there was something else in there. If I could hold on that, ask me a question at the end. The other thing that really appealed to me in this was the notion of um, what's called authentic leadership. A lot of what I've been looking at actually comes out of the, the leadership field. People don't seem to be talking as if ordinary people, people by myself who are not managers, Ordinary people would want to learn this stuff. And so you have to read leadership books and then think how you apply it to yourself even though you're not officially a leader. And, and that's, a, I think, a failing of, of not just our group, but industry at large, but also for Agile. You know, we say, empower the team, let them make decisions, and then we reserve the leadership training for the managers. We should be giving help <coughs> to people having empowered them to make the decisions. How do they work together more successfully to actually come to those decisions? You put three architects in a room, you get five possible decisions and no one can agree. And you know, egos get in the way and this sort of thing. And so much of this learnable skill is how to take those potentially conflict, laden things, those things with egos in the way and turn them into successful interactions. So I was mentioning um, authenticity, which comes from, from the leadership stuff. When I first started trying to learn this uh, some time ago, I read a book on you know, how to be a leader in a technical field. And I felt like it was saying, John, you're like this, and good technical leaders, well, they like that. And I'm like, well, you know, it was sort of almost offensive to suggest I should have to have some kind of personality transplant. And it, it seemed unlikely to succeed. And, and it really put me off. And I actually uh, said, well, I don't want to be a technical leader then. And the interesting thing that comes out of the management research, completely independent from, from Agile, is that the best managers, you know, just managers in general, are not trying to conform to some stereotype of who a manager is. They are being themselves more skillfully. And this, again, is this learnable skill, uh, authentic leadership. And it takes the pressure off. This whole notion that we can learn to do this stuff better. If you say to yourself, and it's true, the goal here is to simply be a more skillful version of myself, 
the, the pressure's off. You're not trying to give yourself a personality transplant. You're not trying to conform to something that's completely different. You're actually trying to do the thing that will work for you and happens to be the best way to lead and motivate anyway. The other interesting thing about this authenticity is because you're being yourself, it's very consistent with building trust. There's this really interesting relationship between political skill, which is uh, you know, uh, influence and manipulation for good causes in nice ways, uh, and how that relates to authenticity. So the political skill can help you get a, a quick win in terms of uh, influencing people. But if they work with you for six months and they realize that you were not being honest with them when you were influencing them, you've undermined your authenticity. If you have both, you have this incredibly good combination for building the trust early and sustaining it going forward. And so that's a really interesting discussion, which we probably don't have super duper amounts of time to get into today. One thing I should stress on this stuff, and I've sort of touched on it a little bit, this is not about, it's going to be the color than that. This is not about the people who are on your org chart. This is about the stuff that happens to the people who are not even on the org chart, the people who sit cutting code, the people who sit at their desks and don't talk to their developers, fellow developers, the people who sit at their desks and talk too much and push their opinions around. And I've been in both those camps and I'm trying to learn to step out of them into a more positive territory. So this is, this is not org chart management -y stuff. This is about empowering the team. This is not also necessarily about training courses. The great thing about this deliberate practice stuff is that you can learn it by yourself. Okay, it's great to have a buddy in your organization you can go to and say, man, that meeting went really badly. You know, um, can you give me some hints on, on how I might do better? But that can be really intimidating. You know, I know I was too scared to do that. But the great thing is that you can apply deliberate practice by yourself. One of the, the interesting stories I came across was a CEO, 35 years old, in charge of this big company, and he got there on the back of his interpersonal skills. And they said, how did you do that? And he said, how did you build those skills? And he said, every meeting, when I came out of the meeting, I'd come back to my desk, I'd get a notebook, and I'd write down essentially lessons learned from that meeting in terms of personal interaction. Now, he basically never read this notebook, but it was a mini personal kind of retrospective thing, like we do in Agile, you know, at the end of iterations. This was his little thing after each meeting. And that took him to a point where he was in, you know, this very important successful position on the back of his interpersonal skills, which he had built that way. And certainly for me, I've not gone down the notebook route, but I've certainly found that deliberate practice, even without a, a mentor or a buddy, is a powerful, powerful thing. So you can learn this. People in the team, you know, teams can learn this. Individuals can learn this. You don't need, you know, high-flying consultants. You don't need, you know, team-building courses with ropes and swings over bridges and stuff. Uh, so, and the other thing is that it does take, take time in this notion of building expertise. There's an element of, of time and patience involved, but there's a great, great payoff at the end. So in the interest of time, what I'm going to do on the, the remaining point, which I want to talk about, so we're going to move on from that now. We'll hopefully come back to it in the questions at the end, because I think it was very relevant to the, the panel discussion earlier. I'm going to talk briefly, very, very briefly, about some stuff that relate to uh, contracts and collaboration. Now I'm going to go very quickly through these three things because they're each written up on my website so uh, I can cheat and not tell you today and you can Google them and get everything that I would say if I had more time. First one is this thing called principal negotiation. Has anyone, anyone read the book Getting to Yes? Cool. Not a lot of hands went up. If you haven't read that book, you should really, really, really read it. It's, it's transformed my thinking in terms of interacting with customers and colleagues, not just about the contract. Uh, book one more time. Getting to yes, yeah. I, I I don't have references for all this stuff in the presentation because um, I've been busy. So what I'm going to suggest later on is that if you want this stuff, you email me, and I will eventually post on my blog references for all of this. Because what's important to me in this is not to just speak from my own experience, not to just have some wild idea here, but to be able to have this backed up with with research and stuff. So I certainly do want to make available to you the, the stuff that I found that backs this up. So um, yeah, that's the whole of those details. Principal negotiation is this wonderful tool for turning negotiation about anything from an adversarial thing into a productive thing, the kind of thing we want on an agile project. And you, it can apply to contracts, it can apply to scope, and it can apply to choosing your process. Alistair mentioned earlier uh, situationally specific processes as part of the declaration of interdependence. For me, my mental framework on how to do a situationally specific process comes out of the work on principle negotiation. 
And all that stuff I just mentioned is on my site. The book is better, it's got a whole lot more too. QBS, quality based selection, otherwise known as qualifications based selection. I work in a company that builds software for other companies. And we have this ongoing challenge of pricing being uh, you know, decided upon early and being involved in making choices as to which company gets to do the work. And I did a bit of Googling and I came across something from here in the United States that was fascinating to me. If I work in a federal uh, government agency and I want to get an engineer or an architect to do some design work for me, I can make that a competitive tender. I can put it out to lots of different firms. I can ask them whatever I like except the price. I have to choose them on their quality. They have to compete on their quality. And only once I've found my preferred one am I then allowed to start negotiating price. If we can't agree on price, I can go to my second choice. What an incredible idea, and it seems so relevant to software. Now, I have no idea how to affect the kind of industry change that would see some recognition of that. But out of the panel this, you know, this morning, we were saying contracts are a big issue. Here's a thing that's working right here in the United States, and it's insanely popular, both with the purchasers and the sellers, because it works. So if anyone's got any ideas on how we can try and get some leverage on that, uh, again, do contact me, please. Finally, the last one. As I said, I don't work in an environment enlightened enough to use QBS, unfortunately, not yet anyway. And so you get the situation where we're bidding against one of our competitors or five of our competitors, and software estimation being what it is, some people bid high, some people bid low. Not because you're intentionally doing that, but because software estimation is inherently uncertain. And so what happens is if we bid too high, we don't get to do the project. Some other sucker who bid low gets to do it. We only get to do the, do the work when we are the sucker. And, <laughs> and so I was having a discussion with this, with someone who is quite justifiably a, a, a world expert in software. And we were talking about this idea, but we couldn't nail it down. We couldn't assure ourselves whether it was a real phenomenon or not. And after a few months of thinking, there's got to be an answer to this, I had another try and Google, and eventually I found this thing called the winner's curse. And it's been known in economics for, I think it's 205 years. And here's this thing that is so relevant to so much pain that we have in software development. It's been known for 205 years, and we haven't, by and large, reached out and grabbed it. There's one excellent paper from the Simula Research Lab in Norway on this. They did a wonderful experiment demonstrating it, applying exactly to software. But apart from that, nothing. So one of the reasons I mention that is it illustrates my broader point of reaching out to the various things around, all these different things that, that exist in, in all these different fields, and reaching out and doing them. And this idea that there's this relevant thing that for 205 years we've missed it, uh, really reinforces the point of value of reaching out and looking at these things. And particularly for me, around this point here, I think there's some real, real emphasis we can do in that space. A couple of bonus points from today. Uh, we've mentioned how evidence-based management applies to the history of Crystal, and it's also essentially telling businesses that they should be situationally specific, which is exactly what we're telling them through the Declaration of Interdependence. Something I've actually cut from my presentation uh, was some stuff about the longer-term view. I've got involved with, um, in various ways, collaborating with people who come out of the uh, Defense Department here in the United States on a thing called Earn Value, and come up with this kind of hybrid thing, which is as much of their rigor as I could. I could sort of stand in an agilist and as much of our lightness as I could shove in there. And it turned out to be a very light thing that's still backed by some, some rigor and stuff. So again, that's completely written up on my website. Uh, I've got the version for agilists and the version for people from the traditional uh, DOD background uh, essentially presenting the same topic. And that's a great way to do some of this longer term view stuff that, that Alistair was talking about earlier. Finally, this point popped into my head during the, um, during the panel discussion. We're talking about how do we build this thing called trust, or whatever it is that it's not trust, it's this thing that we want, we know what it is, even if the trust isn't the right word. And to me, those are the ingredients. Build political skill, be authentic, and it takes time. And I've essentially covered that earlier, but for me, that's this wonderful formula that helps to answer some of this, this thing. And if you can get the early version of it, the bit where they actually don't trust you yet, but you're influencing them to act in a trusting way, you can get the the later version of it when you've been authentic for six months so they know you're brilliant and they love you. And that kind of combination in there I think is really, really powerful. So to wrap up, I guess I want to issue a bit of a call to action here. I'm very, very interested in seeing us, both as a group and the Agile you know, community at large, 
start to make some connections with the outside. When I was doing the year in value stuff, you know, I, I interacted with people from outside our community and it worked really, really well. So if you are interested in that, please, please get in touch with me. I'm really interested in people who have, you know, either new fields or interests in, in these fields. Other thing we need to be doing is influencing inside the agile community. You know, there was only 17 people eight years ago when we made the Agile Manifesto and, and that spread out and influenced a lot of people. We've got, I don't know what it is, 100 in the room or something today. The potential for us to influence and to sell some of these ideas is huge, so I'd really like to see us do that. I have basically no idea how, but great faith in the, in the value of community and in the, in the Agile community. So if you would like to get into that, the simplest thing that could possibly work is email me and I'll try and keep us in touch. I'm not sure that uh, necessarily my email address is the right long-term communication mechanism for, for talking about these topics, but it's the easiest thing that we can do right now and I really, really want to hear from you both because I think this is really important and because I live 8,000 miles away and it gets a bit lonely over there. <laughs> so, I don't think we've really got too much time for questions, um, although of course, you know, this, in my mind at least, raises a lot of questions and so I'd certainly love to talk with people afterwards. I'm just going to check time. When are you coming on, Lee? Now, right? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, we've got five minutes. Let's take a little bit of, just a little brainstorm of questions. I'm going to jot them down here and then I'm going to answer them all in one go if I can. It's a question, it's a question backlog. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I'll introduce this by way of a very brief story. Yeah. Many decades ago, when I was in high school, they had a literary magazine, yeah. and a bunch of uh, youthful, rebellious kids decided to come up with an alternative to it called the Pro Magnet Journal. And uh, one of the papers they published in the Pro Magnet Journal was the Pro Magnet Scientific Method, and it went something like this: Draw your and then look around for enough evidence to support it. And I'm curious as to how evidence-based management and its role in Agile differs from the pro magnet scientific method. In that, yeah, so the question is uh, phrasing the notion of looking around for, um, have I looked around for evidence to, to support my hypothesis? Cool. Um, I will answer that straight away. I know I said I was going to write it on the question, but I'll answer that one straight away, otherwise I'll forget. Um, on one sense, it's a really helpful thing, no matter, how, no, no matter how we found it. On the other sense, as it happens, I was looking at the guy, who, one of the key guys behind it, is also very big in the other fields I had on my other side, and I actually found it through that. So it's like, I just stumbled across this thing. I thought, what is this thing? I thought, gee, I recognize those ideas. So I guess, you know, I didn't set out to put together a presentation on this, and you know, essentially I had most of the impersonal stuff I was a bit light on before I, I thought, man, you know, this might make an agile root stuff uh, presentation. But the other stuff, um, particularly the ones I cut a bit short, I've been accumulating over quite a few years. So I don't think we need to be afraid that we are being shallow here in um, scrambling around for things to prove a point. I think we, instead, we need to see this as being open-minded enough to learn from it and opportunistic enough to leverage the stuff, particularly in the people and their interactions, we would have had a gap uh, in what we were doing. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Could you, can you tie up in space management just a little bit more into Agile? Into Agile. It doesn't say be Agile, right? It says get started and learn as you go. It says change and evolve. It says um, promote uh, what else it calls personal safety, which is essentially the ability to bring bad news to your manager. So in other words, create a culture where it's not just the brave people in this room, as, um, as someone was saying earlier, who are able to say, hey manager, this project isn't working. Create a culture where everyone can say that. So even if space management says these things, and they overlap with what we're saying, that's, that's essentially the language. Thank you. Yep. I was uh, thinking about what you said about individuals and interactions and getting into the positive organizational psychology. Yeah. I was thinking about some of the practices that are really common, popular in agile development, like stand ups and retrospectives and things. Could it be that these things work you know, at a kind of issue level because they can steal from some of these properties? But then now, once you kind of take it to the other level, you realize there's a whole lot of other techniques that you could use. Of the latter. And the question was, is standard agile techniques like uh, stand-ups, 
essentially giving us a, a de facto way to do some of these things that I've been learning about in the people interaction stuff. Maybe sometimes. Um, I think the thing that struck me is there's a whole lot more that we want to know in that. You know, Agile couldn't tell me how to have a successful whiteboard discussion with an architect who completely disagreed with me. And, um, and successful is not I get my way. That's part of, that's part of the, the thing here. Success is we get a good outcome. And so to me, almost in a way, the latter is more interesting. I don't see huge linkages between our standard practices and what this is teaching. I suspect there's some, but it doesn't jump out and grab me. Um, yep, that's it. OK, so I'm sorry we didn't get a bunch of questions, but please do catch up later. And please do email me. I think I'd love to get involved in more ongoing discussion on this. Thank you. Thank you from New Zealand.